In previous lectures, we discussed several examples where we applied the concepts of probability to gambling. So it seems only natural that we should turn our attention to how the theory of probability is going to arise in an area where really great gambles are made, namely Wall Street. Predicting the future prices of stocks can have a significant impact on how we view our whole future financial security. So the question is, how are we going to model the behavior of stocks or other financial instruments so that we can have a guess as to whether or not our retirement fund is going to be adequate to, to keep us uh, living in the lap of luxury? Or uh, what are we going to, how are we going to view what will happen to our investments and their value over time? So we need to somehow think about how to guess what's going to happen in a future that we know is uncertain. Well, one, one possible strategy is that we can just take our financial portfolio, for example, and just run simulations where we put into those simulations various probabilistic components. Now, now the reason that, that we have probabilistic components in them is because there are various aspects of what's going to happen to our, the future value of our investments that are not really determined at this time. Our financial future is going to be determined by such things as whether or not inflation happens or whether or not a, a political event might occur that would have an effect on the value of our stocks. In other words, the future value of stocks isn't a completely deterministic kind of a study. So many of the aspects that determine the prices of future stocks are things that are out of our control and haven't really been decided yet. One of the main reasons that we don't know what the future values are, of investments are, are going to be is that the decisions about how, the, how individuals, human beings, evaluate the the uh, price of a stock is a human decision. And human decisions are notoriously unpredictable. So randomness and probability play central roles in the determination of what our financial future is going to be, and that's why we view it as an example of a probabilistic kind of a scenario. So the question that we're going to be talking about during this lecture is, how do we build mathematical models for the case of trying to, uh, to describe the future prices of financial instruments such as stocks or, or options that we'll talk about in a minute? It, our goal is to make these guesses about what, uh, that is, these mathematical models about how things will behave in order for us to make rational decisions about how, how, we, should, how we should invest our money. Well, uh, back in the beginning of the 1900s, we had the first example of a mathematical model of stock price movement. And there was a gentleman by the name of Louis Bachelier who produced some models about stock prices. And his model had the following feature. He simply imagined that the, the model started with the price of the stock as it is today, and then the future price was determined simply by a random walk. In other words, it would fluctuate up and down and up and down according to just random fluctuation, but it wouldn't have any global trend. And here we have some examples of some simulations of such uh, price fluctuations based on just a random walk. So this is an example where the price started at this, at this stage, and you can see that it randomly oscillates uh, up a little, fluctuates a little up, a little down, a little up and a little down. This would be a typical example of the price future of a stock under Bachelier's model. However, Bachelier's model lacked something. And what it lacked is that there was no underlying trend associated with the value of a stock. And this is something of a defect because one can have the expectation that a certain kind of an asset or stock will actually increase in value over time. That, that is, there's an underlying reason why we expect a, a, an asset to increase in time. For example, let's take a, a cattle ranch. 
So here we, uh, we're imagining buying uh, some investing in a cattle ranch. And the cattle ranch consists of some luscious land full of greenery. And then it also has a certain small herd of, of cattle who are enjoying themselves. And over time, we have the expectation that more cattle will live on this land and the value of that, of that asset will become greater. So there's an underlying trend that we expect. Now, of course, we don't know what's actually going to happen, and that's, that's why we don't price the, the, uh, the value of, of the cattle ranch according to what our expectation will be in 10 years. It will just gradually rise up as the cattle do, in fact, increase in, in number as long as they, that actually happens. So, so the, the model for... Um, uh, so, so that's, a, that's an example of a case where a certain stock has an expectation for increasing in value at, a, at a, a rate that we might be able to predict by some external reason. Other kinds of assets have a cyclical trend to them. For example, the cost of heating oil or corn crops. Those are examples of, of commodities where we expect a kind of a cyclical model. And so, in order to account for the fact that there are trends in various, the underlying stock prices, uh, a more robust kind of model was, was created. And uh, Paul Samuelson was a, 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 an economist who developed a model in the 1960s that, that included three components to it. So basically, the three components are that the today's price is the first component. The second component is a component that discusses the trend. It's a drift component that talks about the trend. And then to that trend is added a random walk feature that models the volatility of the stock. So under that kind of model, we have these kinds of, of uh, descriptions. For example, here's an example where we have a slight upward linear trend together with a random walk. Here's an example of what we might expect from a stock that has a cyclical trend plus a, a random walk. So these are models of, of stock prices that are based on, on these basic concept of a trend together with this kind of random fluctu fluctuation that was described by Bachelier back in the early days of the 1900s. And by the way, something I forgot to say, but I, I wanted to say is that, that Einstein actually used some of Bachelier's work, which was on Brownian motion, in, in Einstein's description of Brownian motion. So, so, in fact, Bachelier's mathematical work on random walks was used uh, in, in physics as well as, as in uh, the world of finance. Well, um, so we've talked about so far the uh, issues about the stocks and modeling how stocks vary in, in price over time. But there's another collection of, of, uh, of investment instru financial instruments that are called options. And option trading has become a very important part of the financial system. And in fact, more money changes hands in the options market these days than in the stock market. So I wanted to spend a few minutes just describing, first of all, what an option is. So a, an option is a contract. And the contract gives the holder of the option a certain specified rights. And the, the rights are generally the right to buy a security or a commodity, you know, a stock or, or a, a, a collection of goods at a specified price at a specified future date. Or other options uh, allow you to sell a commodity at a certain specified price on a, sp a specified date. Now, actually, options can be very complicated. They can refer to all sorts of, of situations. But in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the simplest kinds of options for the most part. Namely, that we have a piece of paper that says the following thing on it. It says that if I hold this piece of paper, I am entitled to buy one share of XYZ stock on April 30th of some future year for $100. Even if at that time, the XYZ stock is trading for a much higher price. And in, in fact, that possibility, the, the possibility that XYZ will be worth more than $100 at that future April date is what gives the option its value. Now, now of course, if I have the option to buy XYZ at $100, and this April date comes around and the stock at that time is selling for $90, the, 
then the option to pay $100 for it is worth nothing. And that is typical of the, of the uh, situation for options. Now, options can be used for two purposes. One is they can be used for speculation, or second, they can be used as hedges against, against um, a possible risk. So, so let me describe these two uses of options. The option used as speculation is just this, that if I have the option to buy a stock at $100, I'm betting that the stock is going to go up above $100. And if, for example, uh, on the April date in which I have the right to buy it for $100, it's actually selling for $150, then that option is worth $50 at that time. Because I, can, I have the right to buy it at $100, and then I can turn around and sell it for $150. So, so it has value to me at that time. So one, one uh, uh, reason for buying an option is for speculation. I'm, I'm betting that the stock will, will go up in this case. But there's another valuable, important uh, uh, use of options, and that is to use as hedges against risk. So, for example, suppose that I own a company that makes computer chips, and I use copper in the manufacture of these chips. Well, copper may be selling for a certain price today. And I have a business plan that requires that I acquire a certain amount of copper in order to do my manufacturing and at a certain price. There's a danger. The danger is that in several months' time, maybe the price of copper will have taken off and then my business plan goes out the window because I have to pay much more for the materials to make the product that I'm producing. So what can I do? Well, I can buy an option as an insurance policy, basically. I can buy the option to buy copper for today's price. Suppose copper is selling for $100 per unit. Well, then I can buy an option to buy copper at $100 per unit three months from now. And that way I know for sure that I can acquire that copper at that price and my business plan is settled. Now, of course, I pay a premium, just like any other kind of insurance premium. I have to pay a premium for the cost of that option. And in fact, that's what we'll turn to now. How much should you pay for an option? The pricing of options, the finding a rational price for options, is a, 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 an idea that happened, that was developed by economists in the late 1960s and early 1970s and really allowed the options market to be created. So let's start with a very simple option and discuss what a rational price for this option might be. So here's an example of an option. The option is that you will pay me $1 if the stock reaches $100. Now, in other words, I own this option. I have bought something that makes you do something else. It's a contract. Namely, you will pay me $1 if something happens in the future. Namely, that uh, let's call it XYZ stock reaches $100 in the future. Now, today, let's suppose it's selling for $87. My question is, how much should I pay for, to, to acquire that option to get a dollar if it reaches a hundred dollars. Well, so you're in a, in a position of trying to decide, well, you know, uh, uh, how much do you think that, that I should have to pay you for that right to get a dollar if it reaches a hundred dollars? Well, you might think that this is a question of probability because there is some chance that it'll reach a hundred dollars and some chance that it won't. Now, you and I may have differences of opinion about what the expectation is with respect to the future of this stock. For example, I might think that there is a, a good chance that the stock will reach $100. And so to me, having the option to get a dollar if it reaches $100 is, is something good. And I could, I could give it as an expected value analysis. For example, if I thought that the probability of its reaching $100 was, let's say, oh, 90%, then, then I can do an expected value 
um, uh, computation and say, well, okay, I'm going to get a dollar 90% of the time, therefore 90 cents sounds like a good price for that option to me. That's what, what it would be worth from my concept of the, my guess of the future. But a different person might have a different guess of the future. For example, you might feel that the stock has a 50% chance of never reaching $100. $100. So if you do your expected value analysis, you would say, well, I have a 50% chance of having to pay a dollar, but I have a 50% chance of never having to pay the dollar. Therefore, my expected value of that, of that option, the, the, the price for it, would be 50 cents. Now, those difference, differences of opinion about the value of the option to, to be given a dollar if the stock reaches 100, that difference makes it why there are... are um, uh, why a deal is to be made. But there's a rational way to set a price for this option. And that is to think about the question, can we get rid of the probability? Can we get rid of the risk in some way? And the answer is yes. We can do something today that will completely get rid of the risk of, of what it would cost to pay a dollar if the stock reaches a hundred dollars. Namely this, suppose that, that you, are, you are contemplating selling me this option so that I would get a dollar if it reaches a hundred. And you are sitting there and saying, oh, I don't really want to worry about that. I don't want to worry about having to pay this dollar if, if something happens. So what can I do today to make sure that I'm going to have the resources to pay off that dollar if the stock reaches a hundred? The answer, very simple. If you buy one one hundredth of a share of the stock today, then you own one one hundredth of a share of that stock. So if the stock goes up to a hundred, you can, one one hundredth of that stock is worth a dollar. You see? So you can do something today that gets rid of the risk. It gets rid of the risk. So, so that is a basic concept about options pricing. What can you do today that does not involve risk that duplicates the risk that you entail by owning the, the option? So the rational price for the option is going to be 87 cents, one hundredth of the price of one share of stock. And that's a rational price for this option. Now, we're now going to look at an example that's a little bit more, um, uh, more interesting in that, that there are more variables involved, but, but still a great simplification relative to actual reality. So here's the example we're going to be discussing. Suppose that we own, uh, uh, that we're talking about an option associated with a stock that today is selling for $100. And we're talking about the option of buying the stock one month from today for $100, the current price of the, option, uh, of the stock. So, so you understand what the, what the option is. The, so the option would be that I have the right to buy one share of stock for $100 one month from now. Now, I don't know whether the stock is going to go up or going to go down, but we're going to make a very simplifying assumption. And the simplifying assumption is that there are only two choices for what will happen to the stock in one month's time. Either it will be $110 or it will be worth $95 one month from today. Now, by the way, this is a, a very simple, uh, of course, a great simplification because in fact, we don't know it could be any price, both between 110 and 95, or it could be greater than 110 or less than 95. But this is the kind of mathematical simplification that allows us to develop tools that then can be applied in the more general cases. In fact, this concept of just looking at a finite collection of possible future values in, at discrete moments of time is called the Cox-Ross-Rubinstein tree. And this was a, a kind of a model for stock prices that allow us to to um, develop a rational pricing system for options. So we're discussing the question of how much should an option uh, be worth that gives me the right to buy a share of stock at $100 one month from today. And the simplifying assumption again is that the price will be either exactly $110 or exactly $95. And those are the only two choices. Well, here's how we think about it. 
What we're trying to do is to replicate the risk of the option. In other words, we're trying to buy some collection of shares of stock. Just like in the last example, we said if we own one hundredth of a share of stock, then we don't have to worry about the risk. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to say, I'm going to buy a certain number of shares of that stock and put it in my portfolio. And then I'm also going to have a certain amount of cash in the portfolio. And by the way, the amount of cash is going to be negative in, the, in this case. So, you're, you're, that is your, your, so you'll think about borrowing money. But you have a particular portfolio whose value is going to be exactly equal to the value of the option in one month's time. That's the concept. In other words, can we own something today that gets rid of the risk? So this is an example where we're trying to actually quantify the value of risk itself. And that's a, an interesting perspective. So here we go. Our, our goal then is to buy X shares of stock in the portfolio and have D amount of cash in the portfolio so that it replicates the value of the option in one month's time. Let's think about it. The price of the stock, we're assuming, is either going to be $110 in one month's time or it's going to be $95 in one month's time. If the price goes to $110, then how much is the option worth to buy the stock for, 10, for $100? Well, the option is worth $10 because you can buy the stock for $100 and immediately sell it for $110. So, the the, the value of the option in one month's time may be $10 if the stock goes to $110. On the other hand, if the stock price descends to $95, then the option will be worth nothing. Okay? So what we can do is write down two equations that capture the reality of the costs of the option. In other words, if we buy X number of shares of stock, and the stock we're selling for $110 in one month's time, and we have D dollars, we want to replicate the value of the option. So we want that number to equal $10. And on the other hand, if we own X, that same X number of shares of stock, and the price of the stock in one month's time is $95, and we have our D dollars in cash, we want that value to also equal the value of the option in one month's time, namely zero, because the option would be worthless if the stock is only selling for 95. Consequently, we, can, we have two equations and two unknowns, and we can just do a little bit of algebra and actually compute what the values are. So here we take these two equations and two unknowns, we do a little algebra, and we find that the solution is that we should buy two-thirds of a share of stock, and we should borrow $63 and, 13, uh, 63 and a third dollars. In other words, by the way, the, the negative, it's, uh, we should have on hand negative $63 and a third, which means that we're borrowing that amount of money. So if we have that portfolio, that portfolio that consists of two-thirds of a share of our stock and, and we owe $63.33, then that portfolio has the same value as the option one month from now. Now let me just say one other simplifying assumption that we're making here, and that is that there is no cost for money. We're not assuming that you're earning interest or not earning interest. So that's a, just a simplifying assumption that would have to be factored in in reality. But here we go. Then what that says is that the cost of getting rid of the risk associated with the option is the cost of two-thirds of a share of, of stock minus $63.33. Well, two-thirds of a share of stock would cost $66.67, right? Or 66.66 cents, two-thirds of 100. And on the other hand, the borrowing $63.33 gives a total cost of the option of $3.33. So in other words, this is the, this, is a way of taking, a, a, analyzing a rational price of risk itself. The risk that's entailed by owning this option and being at, at the, um, at, at, of, of having to, to um, perform at the auction. Uh, in other words, in other words, 
having the option to sell at, at the stock at $100, even if it goes up to 110, that we have made a model which allows us to say that for $3.33, we could replicate the risk by something that we could just own. And now there's no risk to it. If we own this two-thirds share of a stock, regardless of whether the stock goes up to 110 or goes down to 95, the value of our portfolio is exactly equal to the value of that option. And the cost of that was $3.33. Well, of course, that the model that we've described here is a great simplification. And it had to be developed and generalized to m the much more robust example of, of a complicated um, uh, scenario of real life. But the mathematicians who created this kind of a model generalized it to give rational pricings to options. And this gives the famous, this, this kind of analysis leads to the famous Black-Scholes model of options pricing. After the Black-Scholes model came into existence, well, that's what allowed options to be considered as investments rather than as gambling. And, and that led to the options trading houses, like the Chicago Board Options Exchange, which was, uh, came into existence in 1973, really rather recently. But there's a story associated with this options trading, and that's the story of the long-term capital management company. This was a hedge fund that was run out of Greenwich, Connecticut, and was founded in 1994. The man in charge of this hedge fund was John Merriweather, who was a legendary head of bond trading at Solomon Brothers in the 1980s. In addition to the many mathematicians that he brought from Solomon to LTCM, he hired Myron Scholes and Robert Merton uh, to be on the board of directors. And both of them, by the way, went on to win the Nobel Prize in economics in 1997 for their work on options pricing. Well, LTCM used complicated mathematical strategies to trade bond products. Uh, it had it, sophisticated models that were used to describe how certain bond, future bond prices would converge or diverge, and, and LTCM invested huge sums of money into these positions. So LTCM had a really rather large startup of over a billion dollars, and it quickly grew to $4.7 billion in equity in just three years. It was a money-making juggernaut. So to take full advantage of the bond mispricings found by their models, LTCM borrowed. They, they borrowed immense amounts of, of money. In other words, they leveraged their money to, to, uh, to fund their trades. And uh, the company just spun out of control. They borrowed over $125 billion. And in fact, their balance sheet had derivative positions, derivatives or options, derivative positions over $1.25 trillion. Well, so let me explain their strategy. Their strategy was to bet on the relative difference in the prices of two types of bonds. So a, a standard uh, risk arbitrage trade that LTCM used was to bet on the convergence of two prices in the market. So, <clears throat> so say we're looking at foreign bonds versus U.S. Treasury bonds, the prices of those two groups of bonds. And suppose our mathematical models, and, and they had lots of statistical backing to them, suppose these models tell us that the spread, that is the price difference between these two collections of bonds should be, say, 50 cents, but in fact the spread right now is a dollar. Well, according to our modeling then, the price should close. Now, we don't know whether the prices are going to go up or go down, but it, and because all of those things, the, the prices themselves, depend on decisions made by politicians and others that are very hard to predict. But, nevertheless, we can believe that the prices will come closer together. Whether or not the, the underlying price of the bonds goes up or down. So, what we can do is we can invest in options in such a way that as long as the prices come closer together, we make money. So this was the thinking of LTCM. And the further the spread widens, the more trouble that the traders would find themselves in. And that's what happened at LTCM. Things began to unravel for them in about 1998. At that time, what happened was Russia defaulted on its ruble debt, which was viewed as a very improbable event. 
And as a result, investors around the globe sold European bonds in favor of buying more stable U.S. bonds. This caused various bond prices to diverge, whereas LTCM had bet hundreds of billions of dollars that they would converge. And because LTCM had borrowed so much money, they couldn't afford to wait for the bond prices to eventually converge. And so it became a problem of solvency. And what happened is they didn't remain solvent long enough to ride out the spread and, uh, of the bond prices and, and wait until they, they reconverged as they had predicted. Uh, in the end, in fact, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York had to intervene, and it arranged a bailout of several billion dollars by 14 major investment banks. And in all, LTCM managed to lose $4.6 billion in three months. Well, in fact, the bond prices did ultimately converge in 1999, but of course, it's an old story that you have to have the capital enough to ride out the losses until they become wins. Well, this was a discussion of, of gambling and uh, randomness and probability in the world of finance. In the next lecture, we're going to turn our attention to finding probability in unexpected places. I'll see you then.